Blake Edwards, speaking about his new film, That's Life, said, Granting me a lot of poetic license, you could say That's Life was autobiographical in the same way that you could call SOB autobiographical. Both SOB and 10 were inspired by situations or events that occurred in my life and which affected my family, my friends, my work. That's Life could almost be considered a sequel to 10 in that it's the same midlife crisis, but almost 20 years down the line. We'll be right back with Blake Edwards and Julie Andrews. Hi, Hi Harvey. Hi. Is, uh, okay. is everything okay? Mm -hmm. How did you cook the lobster? Well, uh, the chef cooks the lobster. Well, how did he cook it? Well, uh, I think he uh, takes hot boiling water. Yeah, uh -huh. he put it in boiling water. Okay. You know what happens when you put a live lobster in boiling water? He dies? First, he goes, Ugh. Harvey. Yeah, you're eating a traumatized lobster. Uh, you have another way to cook the lobster? Take the pot, fill it with a couple of bottles of dry white wine, turn the heat on, and when it's just lukewarm, you put the live lobster in the warm wine. He likes that. That is one happy lobster. <laughs> Keep turning the heat up. By the time that the wine is bubbling, the lobster doesn't give a shit. Jack Lemon. And Julie Andrews with a restaurant tour by the name of Nikki Blair playing a restaurant tour in That's Life, Blake Edwards' new film. Now, I just told you something, Blake, that I happened between meetings with both of you, be in the city of Los Angeles, be in Nikki Blair's restaurant, and almost made this man drop a menu on the floor by saying, <laughs> saw you in That's Life. You're really very good. <laughs> we know your propensity and use of people in your work. But how did the restaurateur Nicky Blair come to be in the film? Well, Nicky goes way back. He's done I don't know how many films with me. He began as a very close personal friend of Tony Curtis's. And Tony said, would you use Nicky? And so I don't know how many films we've done. We've done, oh, I'd like 10. And of course, since then, Nicky has become a very successful restaurateur. And, uh, he was just opening his new restaurant. We he got to talking. No, he hadn't opened it. Yeah. We got to talking, and I said, hey, you want to go to work? <laughs> there it was. Now, do you and Julie have a permanent booth at Nikki Blair's? No, not permanent, but uh, an emotional permanent booth, not physically necessary. But... I don't think we have as much time getting a table as most people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you must, you must resolve something for us, Blake, because there has been so much press about that's life based on how many pages of an outline were there? How improvisational was your company and your family? Well, there were 13 pages, I believe. 13 yeah. pages of outline or script. Uh, each scene uh, pretty thoroughly delineated within those 13 pages. Where each scene had to go, what we had to accomplish with each scene. Then there were in-depth character studies written so that each person really could read them and tell what he she was all about and then we uh, prior to the film shooting we sat down and we uh, had a kind of group discussion about our characters and how we related to one another and then we went on on the set which in this case happened to be our home. <laughs> and, uh, and we would make it up as we go along. It, that's not very easy. I, I don't mean that I would just turn a camera on and say, all right, do it. Well, we I'll film it. Oh. Work, work, work. All of us contributing until we felt that it was, that's the way it should be. So it was really written by then. Also, um, Blake had the, the luxury of saying, leave that out, keep that in. So that by the time we put it on film for the day, it was pretty much written in stone unless we decided to embellish something because we had a feeling that it needed a piece more, uh, uh, just a little more punctuation or something. Was there any hesitation, Julia, in using your home as your home in the sense of, after all, what you are giving movie-going audiences is entertainment but you're also giving them a part of yourself that you have now relinquished forever yes they've been in your bedroom <laughs> they've seen blake's exercise area mm -hmm. they've seen your vanity table you have you'll to lay it on really <laughs> really you'll never get the total privacy back because you let us see it 
They've even seen our address, actually. <laughs> it's true. There's one shot where you do see the That's address. right. Yeah. Was there any hesitation? Well, there's some ambivalence. Yeah, yeah. there wasn't. Uh, I think we're basically rather lazy. It was the most wonderful luxury to tumble out of bed. and. Uh, uh, that's not the reason she's doing that. Julie though. said they'll never find us in the Channel Islands. I've still got that property. We'll go to Hawaii, <laughs> yeah, to my macadamia right. nut land. Right. We'll rebuild. Yes. Right. Do you know why I say this to you? Because after, over the years of speaking to both of you, and knowing your relationships and the, the levels of loyalty of certain people in the industry towards you, I haven't been aware of a house being given in a film as a character. Since your friend Richard Quine made a movie called oh, Strangers When We remember. Meet, mm. Kirk Douglas, yep. and I still remember that moment when Barbara Rush turned to Kirk Douglas and said to her husband, who'd been unfaithful with Kim Novak, mm. what did I do? What did I do wrong? And the house became either a source of joy or a source of anguish. And architecturally, you saw what they were doing with this house. Hmm. And I thought of that watching your house in Malibu, depending where you were in it. Hmm. That's fascinating. I'm glad it came across. Do you know that film? He has a habit, though, of, of shooting as close to home as possible. And the, the wonderful house in SOB was actually built as a, as a set on, on the, the front of our property. And uh, obviously, sadly, it was taken down after us. We wanted to keep it there. It was such a wonderful house. Do you know one of the moments that people have reacted to very strongly in the film? There, there are many. But you and Sally Kellerman, I suppose part of the setup is what Blake has done structurally, where we think Sally Kellerman is playing the consummate flake. Right. Where this woman is never going to have a thought that will be sustained. Yeah. When she sits down with you on the beach, and you have already gone through what we've seen you go through. Yes. And what one wonders, without you really answering, is just where you and Blake were in discussing where Jillian was at that moment. I think I walked around holding it in for a very long time. I knew that that was a very important scene. And I think I kind of just held it and held it. it I, I don't know if this answers your question, but for me, it's hard. It, it, it's required, but it's hard to let go when you must let go, well, completely just let go. And I didn't want to let go of the reins, and I kind of just kept holding, holding, holding until the moment that I could spill. And so I, I had that in, inside me, I guess, for two or three weeks, just kind of waiting, knowing that the scene was coming up and, and aiming towards it in my head, so to speak. But I don't know if that answers your question. I thought of that because of the candor both of you have offered in the past about analysis, about success, about what goes with success, and how you have said that there you were with ostensibly everything, but not feeling happy, feeling senses of depression, Fortunately, you found you had a talent to write, and you created a character by the name of Mandy. Yeah. <laughs> the circumstances of your creating the book Mandy mm. as your first piece of writing are unique in themselves. But your conclusion at the end of Mandy sounds like a woman who got exactly what she was looking for <laughs> through professional help. I guess we do write ourselves into a corner, don't we? You certainly do yeah. if you've married and have been living for 20 years with Blake Edwards. <laughs> I think you two just exchange it. It's reciprocal. Probably. Fortunately, you can entertain us with it. I hope so. Oh, drop the hope. <laughs> you do. Okay, if you um, say so. All right, on that we'll take a commercial break, very, all right? very, very sure. flattering. Be right back. <laughs> Remember when you couldn't hack it anymore and you said you had to go home? Oh, yeah. And you took the bullet train and I saw you off and cried. And then two hours later you showed up in Kyoto because you couldn't bear to be apart. Mm -hmm. You knocked my socks off. Oh, I knocked off more than that. <laughs> that was the happiest time of my life. I don't think that architecture is going to make me happy. Just being with you. Julie Andrews and Jack Lemon, in a moment from Blake Edwards' That's Life. Now, for those of us who remember your tour of Japan, <laughs> right. you're working with Nureyev. Yes. The television special. 
There's just so much in this film that's so wonderful. I, I was thinking of Blake making remarks about don't protest too much because you'll lose your sense of humor. And as you said about yourself, and if I lose my sense of humor, where will I be? And of course, the wonderful thing you've done all of these years, whether it's Victor Victoria and making people examine homosexuality, liberation, the liberation of inner self, self-discovery, you've never bludgeoned anybody. There are people who disagree with me on that, but then that's fine too. You've always let people examine things, even in drama. And I think of you talking about going back to what you call serious film. And I think, well, when did you leave it? Mm -hmm. You've never not been serious. You've just had your seriousness couched all along. Does it well, confuse I think the, you when I say that? No, no, I think the vernacular really originated with someone else. And because I had a, a lack of choice in being able to describe something other than comedy, I used the term serious film. No, I, uh, I've always felt that I think in my own heart of hearts somewhere, and yeah, my deep conscience somewhere, that uh, that whatever I do has a serious quality to it. I think Clouseau is a very serious person underneath all of that. At least what he exemplifies is very serious. Is that life a comedy drama? Uh, do you like the life. term or do you reject the term? Is, is I, I, I don't reject it because I think that you one always searches for a way to describe something and that seems appropriate. I mean, uh, there are things that have happened to us in life that are so hilariously funny and yet that's life. It isn't that our lives are a comedy or anything else. I think I think life is like that. If life we, is very, If we really stop funny. and take a look at it, that's what it's all about. And if we don't see it that way, it's just because we choose not to see it that way. But it, But it is that way. It's full of those moments of absurdity, if you care to look at it. My biggest problem in my life is that uh, eventually I will see the funny side of things. But uh, too many times I don't, when it's really serious, I don't see it quick enough. Uh, you know, if I saw it quick enough, I would be in great shape. <laughs> oh, Blake, I think that there are times when you've seen it so quickly that even yes. you couldn't deal with it. Yeah, well, that's true. But a lot of times I, I could save myself a lot of pain if I chose to or if I were able to, uh, to see the humorous side of it at the time it's happening. As you say that to me, and because we had looked at film clips, a collection of film trips, a montage of some of your work, some of the 45 feature films you have given us. And I was looking at the Wild Rovers, and I know what the Wild Rovers means to you as a filmmaker. I know what's in that film for you and about you. I also know about James Aubrey. And just to show how crazy life can be, is it true that you were in the car driving along Sunset Boulevard, took it a turn sunset, but it's off good. Sunset somewhere, turned the car, barely, barely missed hitting a jogger, felt a sense of panic, looked in the mirror and realized the man you had almost struck was James Aubrey. And being Blake Edwards, you said, no one would believe it. That's right. And if I had hit him, no one would have believed it was an accident. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean about you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it happened. It really did. I have, to, I have to resolve something for myself because I've never really asked Julie this in the past. When you had that house in Coldwater Canyon before the move to Gestad mm -hmm. and having homes in different places in the world, and it was reported that you lived in the former home of Vic Tanny. Yes. And because of Blake's passion for physical fitness, <laughs> not to mention his brief time as a man who ran a health club and got ripped off. Right. Did you, did you say as a gag that you'd found a set of barbells in the closet and it's just stuck around all these years? You didn't mean it, did you? Uh, I didn't guess But it was Vic Tanny's house? But it was Vic Tanny's house, yes. Yes. <laughs> did that influence Blake? Uh, did he I don't exercise know. I never asked more him. strenuously in that did it house? No, uh, maybe I don't know. it was it the reason he proposed in the first place. He, <laughs> he liked, liked my it house. It could have. <laughs> it might have influenced my uh, cousin who ended up marrying Vic's daughter. No. D.W., sure. Really? Yeah. D.W. Owen married Vic's daughter. Well, I have to. Yeah. 
You didn't know that. No, I, if I did, it you met went in one ear and out the other. You just didn't realize that that was Victoria's daughter. No, I didn't. Yeah. Because we have you in Canada, and it's taken so long to get you together in Canada. Keep me here. I love it. All right. <laughs> fine. I'm not forgetting, by the way, about the boat. Your passion for being on the boat as a family. I'll ask you one more time. There have been so many projects announced involving the two of you. There was a story of Rachel and the Stranger mm. that you wanted to redo with Julie on the Canadian Lakes. You've recently come off the Canadian mm -hmm. Lakes. Did you turn to each other at any point and say, where is that script on Rachel and the Stranger? She brought it up not too long ago. I don't know whether it was on that trip or not. I think I was saying how sad I was that we didn't do it. Yeah. Because it is such a beautiful country. And, and we do love it so. But um, I think I, that probably I'm much too old for the role now. I mean, I, I don't think I would be right for it now. We're both too much <laughs> too old for the role. <laughs> it's a lovely screenplay for someone, though. Mm -hmm. All right, on that, we'll take another break. Okay. Be right back. <laughs> Harvey, you go up to the house right now, and I'm going to. And I don't mean up to the house. I mean forever. What the hell is that? Now, I know you're going through some kind of personal hell right now. I know we have our problems. You hate birthdays, and you hate getting old, and all of that. But honestly, Harvey, I think you've got some kind of priority on those feelings. I bet you there isn't a person in this room who isn't absolutely terrified of their mortality. You better face something, my friend. You better face it. We are all going to die one day. Now, it seems to me you have three choices. You can take your own life. That's a stupid and vicious thing to do. And what kind of a legacy is that to leave your kids, hmm? Or you can look at what's right under your very nose, which is that you have three beautiful children who adore you. You have a wife who happens to think you're the best thing since chopped liver. You can take my hand. Let me be your mate. You can be my mate. Let us be equals. We'll go through the time we have left together, side by side, and face it, Harvey. Or you can do what you have been doing, which is being a child, sulking, pissing it all away, just acting so dumb it's ridiculous. You can do all of that. That'll be just fine, but you'll be doing it without me, because that is not the man I married, and it's not the man I want, okay? Hmm. <laughs> Well, Miss Andrews, yes. <laughs> that is an extraordinary moment in an extraordinary film. I'm glad that you think so. One take? Uh, I think we, we tried about three, didn't we, Blake? Yeah, yeah. about three takes. But the, yeah. that if you want to be really detailed about it, it was probably the one good close-up. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, but I mean, I... We did it a number of ways. Yeah. Watching that and thinking again about what's in the film and what the family unit means and the family you brought together in that's life and Remembering how when you moved to Switzerland and you were writing You had five children You said Julie was giving up a lot of work and you realized you said without being a chauvinist or suggesting a woman's place was in the home or kitchen <laughs> that you felt you might somehow survive without your family, but you could never survive without your profession. Mm. Mm. Is that a constant? Yeah, that's right. If it had to come down to that, if I it probably had, is. If it ever had to come down to that, I, I guess, yes, I, that's true. If I didn't have my profession, if I couldn't, profession, I don't know whether that's a good word, if I couldn't, I guess it is. If I couldn't write, if I couldn't express myself creatively, I would destroy my family. So, given the choice, it would have to be that. Have you always known this about the man you married? Well, it's, honestly, it's not dissimilar from the, the, the way I feel, which is that, uh, I mean, I have terrible guilt about, about being a mum and then having to go away and work very hard, and I try to make quality time with my children and I'm always guilty about leaving them and I'm always worried but if I had to give it up I would be a terrible mother I would be I would be angry at my kids for keeping me home when I really get such pleasure from what I do so I think it's better that they see me enjoying myself and I set some kind of an example uh, and I know what Blake means. He doesn't mean that it's going to happen or that it's ever going to come down to that but if he but didn't have what you he recognize wants, that. Yeah. It really is essential that you deal with it, even if it's just hypothetical. You say, okay, because uh, 
probably I wouldn't be able to survive under any conditions. I mean, if I did that, because I would be so devastated by the loss of my family. But if there was the barest chance of survival, it would probably be so that I could continue to express myself creatively, which is the only way I've been able to survive most of my life. Julie, your friend Carol Burnett, who has said a number of extraordinary things about you in the past, <laughs> said that the most wonderful... <laughs> I blush at some of them, I can imagine. I'll tell you the one I can repeat. Okay. That perhaps the finest, most courageous thing you've done in your life, in a life full with courageous acts and gestures... She's a fine one to talk. ...was the adoption of your two daughters, finding them in Saigon in the orphanage. We know about your trip to Southeast Asia. We know where they are and how well they are now. And I just pause in the middle of talking around and about That's Life as a movie to remind the people looking at you now on this screen that there are moments involving children in this film that are so tender and so moving. I'm glad you like That we know that they're yours. Uh, they're yours and Blake's and they've been put on film. It helped a great deal that they really were ours. I mean, I think it made an extra intimacy that may not have been there with other talented actresses. But what's so sweet, Brian, is that the two, uh, the, the film only deals with our three oldest children. It doesn't deal with our two youngest. And they were plodding through all the cables and the wires and helping serve cups of tea and doing all the sweet things and being and very generous be and dying to be in it too. Yes. And waiting for their union cards <laughs> at home in Malibu. Yeah, right? Mummy, why can't we, you know, that's the part you don't see. Thank you. Thanks. Brian. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you.